Hey everybody, P.A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show, sitting here in a hotel room on the road doing this ride across the nation to raise money for Save the Brave as we try to battle veteran suicide. You can always support us at savethebrave.org. Click on the donate tab, put a small amount of money in, and that'll help us to help keep veterans alive. The other thing I wanted to say to you is we have back for the third time on the show, Mark Pellington. He's a director who's directed, I don't know, uh, uh, several hundred music videos from all of the big bands that you would know, including Pearl Jam, U2, uh, all kinds of bands. The other thing he's done is directed a number of movies. Maybe you would know him from Arlington Road with, I think, Richard Gere was in that, and I, I just he's such an interesting dude because of the way he approaches the world and things. Uh, it's fun because we have the Pete's on this episode. Hashtag the Pete's. Pete Koch joins me because he's in the business of making movies and. Mark has a significant tie to the NFL as well, just like Pete. Now, Pete played in the NFL, but Mark's dad played in the NFL. And I think Mark's brother might have played too. And Mark had a, a budding career, but before he really could fix knees, he blew his knee out and ended up going the artistic route, which ultimately I think he thinks is the right thing anyhow. So interesting to have Mark on talking on again and also talking about as a director, producer of movies, what it means to put a movie together in these modern times with how we approach the problem of COVID and how we approach the people problem in general. I think you're not going to hear this kind of insight on other shows because we're able to, because we know Mark, we can get into these things that are a little bit more challenging about the business aspect of it. Either way, I know you'll enjoy this episode. If you want to support Scott and I on the ride, we'll be on I-20, I-10, and then I-8 as we go back through Texas to Tucson to all the way over to Temecula. And We'll get welcomed back there with a party in Temecula, so you can join us along the route to ride your motorcycle with us or cars and escort, or you can contribute money, or you can just continue to be as supportive as you've already been. Thank you all so much for that. Okay, one last thing to tell you, and that's here comes Mark Pellington. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Mark Pellington. You're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Mark has been on the show. What, gosh, this is your third time. I think we did it once at, at um, Hilliard's office. We did it once at your place. And then uh, now we're doing it today live. But this time it's with the Pete's. So we got Pete Koch in the house too. Hey, Pete, what's up? Hey, nice to meet you, Mark. You too. So Pete, when I told you that we're going to get Mark Pellington on, um, I said, you're going to want to look up what he's done. What did you discover when you looked up Mark? If probably we just took 30 seconds, we could find uh, a bunch of people that we would know or know about having nothing to do so much with Hollywood, but the same four years that you were attending school at the University of Virginia, I was playing football at the University of Maryland. And, and of course you were playing uh, lacrosse there, which is, I mean, that rivalry in and of itself, right? Maryland, Virginia, pretty good football ri rivalry also. And just the fact that you grew up in, in Maryland, your, your father's a, you know, a legendary part of the, uh, of the Baltimore Colts. There's all kinds of, all kinds of common, I didn't really expect. I thought I was going to read all this this great background of you as a filmmaker, but uh, there's this uh, sort of geographical and, and athletic connection that uh, I really appreciate. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love Baltimore. Fond memories of University of Maryland. Memories, even Maryland basketball and Tom McMillan and Len Elmore. You know, growing up when it was ACC basketball. Um, and it broke my heart when Maryland joined the Big Ten. That was the beginning of the end of, of regionalism and the, the blatant, just like cash grab of college athletics. When Maryland went to the Big Ten, I'm like, sorry, that was, that was a dagger in the heart. Yeah, I'm with you 100% on that. And it was a shame that they had, the uh, University of Maryland had, uh, uh, run themselves into the ground uh, financially in their athletic department and it made a money grab uh, at that point uh, so that's uh and so so forever kind of lost those great uh uh maryland virginia rival rivalry games yeah. have those memories though for sure yep 
Yep, yep, yep. Like everything. Yeah. Seems like it's just memories now. But uh, that's what the old guys lament. Yeah. Is there a, a lacrosse stick anywhere in your house that's, that's yours? Absolutely. I had two of them from UVA where I played. I gave one to a young man, a young, uh, young man who I turned on to lacrosse, his kind of family friend. But I kept the other one. Yeah, it's just, you know, you hold on to it. Some, some, some foot locker with other stuff. That's it. And I think in a pair of old shoes, a pair of old Converse, we were like sponsored even early on by Converse. And my memories are tearing my knee on the AstroTurf in Scott Stadium in Charlottesville, like the worst AstroTurf, the kind of AstroTurf that was still a remnant of like Riverfront Stadium and mm-hmm. uh, Veteran Stadium, like super hard concrete, like, you know, like zero give. I was like, geez, people were talking about AstroTurf. I'm like, this AstroTurf was a nightmare. Terrible. I played a little bit of uh, soccer, and we're talking in school as a class, but we had a turf field. And Pete, you must know about this. The field we had, the grass laid in one direction. If you slid that way, fine. You're going to get a nasty burn, but you can totally tell her. If you went the other way, that stuff was like hell on. It was like an absolute cheese grater. It took skin off instantly and gave you a burn. Is that the kind of stuff you played on, Pete? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I played in a Scott Stadium myself, and it was it was brutal. You know, it was that was that old, antiquated, late, that was probably installed in the mid-70s. And by the time we played in the early 80s, it was just like just playing on a, on a rug in your living room, and it burned you. It was awful. You played at Bird Stadium, right? Yeah, yeah. My brother was an All-American theater that I at UVA, and he tore his knee up in Bird Stadium. Oh. His junior year, yeah. That was grass. Grass. I was right behind the goal watching it. Yep. I used to love going to – I used to love beating Maryland in lacrosse. So when did your athletic career end? Was it in college, or did you continue – and do you even continue to do athletic things now? My athletic – well, I would say my athletic career really ended when I tore my knee in high school and my dream of playing college football went away. I was getting recruited. I went to a little school, in, a private school in Baltimore, but I was good and I had the drive. I was getting recruited by like um, Carolina and Clemson. A Clemson scout came and saw me. And then the third year, I was getting letters from like, I was like maybe going to go to Penn. And then the fourth game of my senior year, I tore my knee, my ACL, and that was it. I was done. So I played lacrosse. They said, oh, you can walk on. I'm like, well, I'm not going to go to Clemson to school and walk on. Uh, so I went to UVA, followed my brother, took a little bit of his scholarship, and played lacrosse, and it was fine. It was just like it was three to six every day. It was athletics. It was my worst sport. And I sat on the bench for two years as an attackman until they said, look, if you ever want to play, you should play defense. It was great. It was great to be part of a team. And and that was it. You know, I don't do anything now. (laughs) I'm bad at tennis. I bike, but nothing. Yeah. You know, nothing organized. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, the filmmaking aspect, because ultimately that's what you do. I mean, we always talk about uh, your movie Arlington Road, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm a huge fan of your uh, movie that you made with you, too. That 3D film is maybe the best 3D film I've ever seen. You know, just you've got an incredible body of work. How is this whole COVID thing? I, I know you're very particular about how and when you, you do your movies. How has this COVID thing hit you in terms of your plans for production? Well, I'm not. Uh, nobody's making anything. I mean, I'm trying to line up a couple of movies. You know, like setting up a movie takes a while. Um, and it's just less and less movies get made. And I've never been on the track to do a Marvel movie. So I make independent movies, small ones. The last one I made, Nostalgia, was like a million-dollar movie. After that, last fall, I made a movie for Quibi the Katzenberg app and they happened to release that movie in the middle of the virus, which was not timing, good timing. Right. That was an $8 million um, action movie called survive with Sophie Turner from game of Thrones and Corey Hawkins. And I'm really proud of that. And the 
the deal was you make a movie for Quibi for the app, and then it gets released 18 months later theatrically around the world or on streaming in the U.S. But the virus has just effed everything up for everybody in terms of start dates and setting up. And it's, you know, like it's, I'd say right behind the live event business or live sporting events, it's right behind there in terms of calamitous victim of this virus. And I mean, like anybody, everybody's just scrambling and like trying to set up some TV things. We're doing a TV series version of Arlington Road, setting that up, patched to a couple of other TV things. But that, that's, those are slow burns. They take a long time before you can actually get into production. So I'm not realistically thinking that I'll shoot anything of substance till next year. Wow. Hopefully by the fall, they allow some scouting. Maybe I'll do a commercial. If, you know, the protocols you just got to open up. No, one, no one's shooting now. And they're slowly exploring what you need to do to shoot safely. I think the same way that the, um, uh, you know, Major League Baseball and football, and they're all like, this. what do we do? How do we keep the, you know, how do we keep people safe? Hmm. You know, it's just that great leadership up top from the government that's really making us all feel super secure and giving us peace of mind. Uh, uh, yeah. So I don't know. Nobody's making anything. So not even like pre-production stuff where you guys are really effectively doing, because I mean, it's hard to like, we can pre-produce to a certain point, but you actually have to have a project that's actually going to happen to actually advance the pre-production, right? Well, you pre-produce a movie, oh, okay, eight weeks of prep or 10 weeks of prep or six weeks of prep with a start date in mind and you yeah. lock actors with a start date. But nobody's setting start dates because no production can get insured, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a couple of Netflix shows shooting in, like there's one in Iceland and there's one that's being independently insured and bankrolled by some producer. And a lot of things that are finishing, you know, that were like a week out of shooting or needed five days left or two weeks left. And those guys are incentivized. They need to finish that shit and get it delivered. But, you know, not, there's no big, you know, I don't know. Once, no one's making anything. How can you prep something when you don't have a start date? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I gotta, I, I can chime in with one, you know, little sliver of a positive story. A um, writer, a writer friend of mine has got a script and over there at uh, William Morris and Endeavor, they have signed a, a director to it, attach the director and legally, you know, kind of taking that next step. And there are, so, and I, I find this conversation fascinating because I don't know much about it, Mark, but the, you know, those, those, those step-by-step -step process. And once they had a, a director attached to this, to the script, that's people love it's a promising script. So they've got this uh, director attached to it. And then they put an offer out and sent the script to uh, an A list uh, star. And, um, who's, who actually has been sort of sitting on it. And I guess what happened was they attached, uh, I find this interesting, but this is the way meetings have to be done sometimes is they put a time limit on it a couple of weeks, you know, let's not wait, wait one way or another, but in two weeks, we're going to move on to uh, kind of, you know, run through their pecking order and, and make the next offer. Standard. Is that standard? Yeah. And I've waited on another ones after for like six weeks and I'm like, well, we just, we just move on and people are incredibly rude. And sometimes you get a good quick response. And so I cook like four pots and like, oh, offer out here. I have an actor attached, so I'm trying to get financing. And you send an offer out, and like, you know, because they, they can sit on it. And again, nobody's now even like, okay, well, what am I committing to? So they're, uh, you know, yeah. So sometimes it all depends on your relationship to the agent and, and getting the read and who the producer is. And it's a maddening part of it. I hate the business, I hate chasing actors to trigger financing. It's better when you've got the movie finance and great, they're making the money offer to an actor. Then, then you get a reasonable shot. Yeah. You got two weeks, you put a date on it. And if not, you move on. Oh, we'll wait an extra week. But because you're making a money offer in your finance, that's much better than chasing actors to trigger mm -hmm. your finance. Then you're mm -hmm. at the bottom of the pile. Week, you know? 
And, you know, just to add a little bit of, um, you know, uh, you know, re relating to this time of, of COVID, just to relate, uh, to add a little bit more sort of intrigue uh, or, or uh, to this whole, in, this, in the case of this particular film, is um, they're looking to shoot it in Texas. And because states are opening up uh, with uh, wildly different time frames, um, the, 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 I think, I think, you know, Texas is already partially open. So the opportunity to get that I think I, I think on, on without doubt that films or TV are going to be produ uh, be in production, in Texas before California. And, um, and yeah, it's just going to be the, unions, the unions haven't allowed the unions, well, they can go shoot a non-union movie all they want with uh, a bunch oh. of ding dongs. But if you want SAG actors and, union people the unions have not agreed upon a safety protocol the same way the baseball players union it's like they're not going to just let people go shoot with like wait a second what is your testing pro like there's no so yeah there's some renegades hmm. like fine we don't care about insurance we're gonna shoot some stupid horror movie with like a bunch of unknowns well great that's like the same idiots that are swimming in the ozarks like great go ahead so everybody can rush a nail salon and a production of 150 people on a crew are two completely different beasts. Mm. I, I know, like I'm bidding on a commercial. They want to shoot in Georgia in July. I'm like, oh, right, what's this? what's the safety? Yeah, you know, I'm 58 years old. I'm like close to the. I'm like, I'm not. I'm not taking it lightly. You know, like, okay, wait, am I flying to Georgia? Am I driving? How big of a crew? Like, you know, like. I'm just like the, I feel terrible for the college football players. They're like, they have no union. They're just like blatant yeah. sheep coming in. Sure, we'll let you, you're safer to practice at the school. That's such bullshit. You know what I mean? Like, great. Just be up front. It is about money. We understand. It's a bad thing for the, these colleges to lose all their money, uh, which funds the other schools. Fund, I mean, funds the other sports, sports. right? But it's fucking terrible, however you look at it, across the board. So I, lo I love the idea of the energy to get back and open up. And maybe a 40 out of 50 states, if it's declining, great. But no one knows anything. What's your responsibility as a director, Mark, when you, they're like, hey, yeah, we're going to shoot this thing. You know, we don't know anything. We have protocols, but fuck, those things change every two weeks, you know? So if you take a gig, what do you owe those 150 people? I'm not a, I would never, even I've produced movies myself that I've, you know, it's been through my LLC and my corporation. Yeah. You can't get insured. Right. I'm having a friend who's having a really hard time shooting the last four days in Mississippi on a movie, high profile movie, just to get the last four days in the can in Mississippi, which I think has opened up. It's like, it's, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean, it's like, What's the point? Just wait it out. Like, there's no movie that's so, and again, a movie that's not made, there's no stake. That's not the same as a school that if they don't have the college football season, they lose $70 million or whatever the money is that funds the other sports. Therefore, now you're depriving other kids of playing their sport. That, that's damage. That's like unemployment, right? But to say, oh, we're not going to finance a movie that hasn't been made. That's not essential. Who the fuck cares? No one cares about my thriller that I want to make. Like, no one cares. All these streaming places have enough product to last. You think people are really going to run out of shit to watch on Netflix or Amazon? No, right? You can never run out. So, I don't know. I think we just got to see where we are in about six months is my, is my feeling. So what do you do then? Do you, do you, I mean, I know you like to write and everything. Do you just work on writing or how do you, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis to, to scratch? I your write, I make, I made a music video where I had a state, I shot an artist in England with a cinematographer who went and shot the artist socially distanced. And I went in around LA and shot with a guy socially distanced and shot some drone stuff. So, you know, I make a little music video. I'm going to make a little socio-political three-minute piece. I do, I do fine art. I work on photography and painting, and I write. 
and you know, again, setting up some TV things that could take a while to get like to pick the writer, then get the deal done and go through business affairs. Those things take a long time. So I'm trying to, I've got a bunch of small scripts that I've commissioned through, you know, small ones where I can pay a writer a small amount and, you know, it might take them three months to write the script, but get stuff cooking. And because you don't have anything unless you have a finished script ready to go to an actor or financier. So I try to be like, what idea do I have on my computer in my head? If it's in my head, get on my computer. If it's on my computer, get it to be a paragraph. Get it either write it myself or get it to be just build it to fruition. Right? Be no good to say, oh, I want to do a thing about it. Either do it or dump it. So again, but I'm also I'm like 58. I don't like how much longer am I going to do this? 12 years maybe if I'm lucky. So. I just want to like get a few movies made, a few TV shows made, get my daughter five years from now out of college and see where we are. So everybody's got their own like short term and long term goals. Yeah. Those are mine. I never run out of shit to be creative with or be busy on. Well, that inspires me to think that Mark Pellington is uh, got that many projects going at any given time that you can kind of reach into and, and work on all artistic, but different mediums. And I think uh, every actor like me, that's just, a, you know, a guy that's been in the business kind of shuffling around, uh, trying to trying to make his moves, um, who needs needs to hear something like that from time to time about exactly how, how hard people um, work when they're not even, you know, working, quote, working. Um, they're always up to something as, as 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 Pete will attest from time to time when I'm speaking some, to somebody in the the arts like yourself, um, I'll I'll mention that I've had the, the the great fortune to to work with Benicio del Toro for about eleven years now. I, mm. I work with him in the capacity of and I'm his fitness guy, I'm his personal trainer. So I've been in his life. Hey, he's not an action star, but he's just you know a guy in his fifties that is looking to maintain his health as he, as he moves through life. I've had the great fortune to, to have a conversation with, with him about things. Just a, a quick example, literally last week, we'll discuss things like, what, have you, what, what are you looking at? What, have you, what are you reading? And he says, and he, I didn't even ask him in this particular case. He says, I want to tell you about something I'm reading. You know, I'm reading Home Iliad, and I'm rereading it, really. It's been a lifetime since I read it. But this now, now I'm reading it you know, with my 50-year-old brain. And man, I am so about this thing right now. And the when I showed up to work out with him a couple of days later, boom, he just goes, boom, here it is. Gave me the book. He goes, start digging into that, and then we can rap about it. And that's about the seventh book that he's given me. <laughs> and yeah, so now you have time. You have time to do those things or work on those things. And I think it took a while. So I'm used to it. Like I work three and a half months straight. Some TV episodes, a couple of Star Trek shorts, a short film, like two commercials. Then went to Europe and did that thing for Quibi. So I worked like nine months straight. So when I finished at the end of February and had a few weeks of like meetings and just like, you know, stuff like getting back to what you're going to do next. I was prepared for a, a three month. I said, let's see where I am in June. I was like, look, it's going to take me that long to figure out what maybe is going to start to happen for the summer and the fall, you know, but I knew that it was going to take me that long to kind of like, so I'm used to this feast or famine, you know, like some, the greatest luxury you could have. And I'm sure actors say the same thing is go from one movie to another or a movie to a TV show to a thing. So usually you just you roll from one thing to another. Uh, maybe you do a commercial, then you do like again, I've been fortunate to have opportunities, but you know, there's opportunities that come you don't get. You go for a movie, you don't get it. You go for a TV show, you don't get it. Huh. Like you there's rejection constantly, no matter how much shit you've made in your life constantly there's a lot of competition there's a lot of talented people there's the specificity the cultures change what they're looking for who they want to do it so you know that's why a couple of years ago i was like i'm gonna try to produce more i'm gonna try and like 
I feel like I have pretty good instinct for material and can mentor filmmakers, you know, could be a good ally to a filmmaker or a TV show and don't have to do the lion's share of it. And so I was like, oh, let me see. But so that was a mission that I said a couple of years, about a year ago, I said, let me see where I am in a couple of years. If I get one of these movies and, you know, because they're all hard work, but, you know, it's like to say, what am I doing today to move the ball forward? Yeah. You get shit. So I figure if you're cooking 10 pots, right? One of them, there's going to be good news <laughs> on one of them every day. Even if like actor pass, da, 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 company pass, rejection, you're like, hey, David Duchovny really liked the script and wants to talk next week. Cool. That's a win. Now, maybe it's like baseball. Maybe you need to get like three out of 10 yeah. <laughs> to hit 300. But like in, right? Out of every 10 things, I tell him my brother, my brother's in commercial real estate. And he goes, yeah, you know, he'll do these big proposals and big things. And I think he has a higher percentage if you're working in that realm of high-end commercial real estate. But he'll spend a lot of time on something. And they'll spend a lot of money to do the prospectus for something and not get the gig. That sucks. But that's the nature of it, you know. I've got a question, Mark. If I could just mm -hmm. kind of pick your brain uh yeah. it's it's a great opportunity for me and uh it's something i i've always kind of thought about a lot in 60 80 productions i've been involved in over the years and it's something i've had a discussion with with benicio and many of my actor friends and that is that uh, if you could maybe just sort of opine for a minute like that relationship at the beginning of a project could be in pre-production or could be like the first day on the set with your let's just say for argument, your, your lead actor, actress, and that relationship when it comes to, um, and I'm curious to how you go about it as a director, that relationship to um, offering input to an actor's performance. I think there's a couple of stages and they're all input because it's a relationship of trust mm. and uh, experience. And so like, I learned early on in my career that through some mentors and through some actors that on my first movie going all the way in 1996, Cameron Crowe was a friend of mine. He says, don't try to be their best friend, be a benevolent father figure, right? Because you have to be a psychologist, psychiatrist, father figure and coach and general manager to a group of actors. Now maybe you have an ensemble of eight, maybe you have two, it's a two-hander, it's an ensemble, and you've got somebody experienced, somebody inexperienced, and somebody needs a hug, somebody needs a kick in the ass, somebody needs constant reassurance, somebody likes to rehearse, somebody doesn't like to rehearse. So each one is different. So you have to customize your skill set. And what I learned early on was to ask, and I learned this from Jeff Bridges on Arlington Road, is like, say, what's your process? How do you like to be directed? How can I help you get the best performance? And that's after sharing, you know, you share, you both like the story. It's obvious they, they want to do it. And maybe they've got some thoughts on the script, but they're doing it because you share the same text, right? You both like the script for the Iliad or Joe Johnson and the Johnsons, right? Like you both like it. He likes the character. She likes the character. She likes the story. Great. So you, you share the text, you like it, and you share a, a trust begins at that point. So you say, how can I help you be the best performer that you can be? I like to do this. I don't like to do that. And you listen. Then you say, great, here's my process. And they're like, oh, I like that. I don't like, you know, like, so, but you let them go first. And then they share. Then you say, great, let's read the script. Let's just read it. Let's just read it once. Uh -huh. How do you feel about the tech? Right? And then you have to, you, you, the, the casting, and each one is different, right? Each piece is different. Your job is to get the best performance out of them. You trust them because you believe in their work. And I've worked with inexperienced actors on TV shows and commercials and movies and like really experienced actors that you leave alone. All actors like to be directed. It's the degree by which you direct them. Talking doesn't make directing 
I learned that from James Earl Jones on an episode of Homicide early on. I wanted him to take a pause between two long monologues. I must have talked for 10 minutes. And he says, son, all you have to do is tell me to take a pause. Like, so valuable lesson, valuable lesson. So each time you learn something new, you learn something new because each actor is different and you have to trust your instincts and you certainly pick up tricks from actors over the years. You watch other directors direct, you observe, you read books. Oh, how does he do that? How does he not do that? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You watch other directors direct, you observe, you read books. Oh, how does he do that? How does he not do that? And it really doesn't matter. Everybody's got their own style because every actor's got their own way they like to work. So you kind of have to, you know, understand that. Sometimes you have to walk on eggshells. Sometimes you have to be tough. Um, Sometimes you have to stick to your... I remember I was going to do a movie with Harrison Ford. Oh, my God. He had agreed to do the movie. I had pitched the movie. I had one meeting with them. He liked it. And so we're making the movie. And they said, Harrison wants to go to the script beat by beat. And I remember coming home and thinking, oh, my God, I just played tennis with Serena Williams. Like, I just got, wow. But, and there were some things he's like, oh, uh, we should do it like this. But I was like sticking to my guns. I said, no, this is why I don't believe this. I believe that's an archaic way of doing this thriller and we want to do X, Y, and Z. And so you have to gain his trust, his confidence. He came in and said, I saw your two other movies. I didn't believe either one of them. I'm like, wow. Okay, yeah, they were maybe a little more stylized. So how do you do with that? So you have to face some tough struggles or an actor not coming out of their trail or like whatever it is and you got to be like okay just kind of patience and experience and i remember doing a movie and like one actor was not getting the lines and the other two actors were getting pissed and this was a low budget movie up in big sur and i literally thought this thing might fall apart this movie might collapse and i just waited it out right you wait it out like you're on a ship and there's 20 crew members there and the actors. And it's like, I just was like, I'm going to keep my hand on the till, on the rudder or whatever it is. And I'm just going to let us get through this squall. And I waited about five minutes and one actor went outside and got some fresh air. And the other one smoked a cigarette. And the other two were sitting there. And I remember just like being there and I nodded to the two camera people. I just said, roll. And I just sat there and said, okay, action. And they just went into it and like, they'd work through it. The same way a child works through a tantrum, right? The same way that you work through something when you need to take a walk around the block. So you know, that was experience. And that I didn't overreact or try to fix it. And um, certainly having kids helped me be a better director. You have to really learn some patience. Um, so there's probably a million answers to your question in that one answer. Well, you cover a lot of ground. I mean, I appreciate yeah. it. And my take home message on, on your approach is it's one that's, that's very fluid and you're, you're trying to match to the personality. And I think this is very important by the way, as, as a coach um, to be an author, author, authoritarian coach is, is we got to, you know, let's say in my example, being a defensive lineman, I, I, I had many, many coaches over the years. Some were, some were, some were good and some were terrible, honestly. And, and they were, they're like, this is the way to do it. And you're talking to nine guys that have very different personalities. Some are, some are uh, very, very sensitive, even though they're playing a tough sport and, um, and just to scream. And, you know, if you got a scream or yell or type of uh, coach, he's just turn. I, I, I personally can't stand anybody screaming at me. And, uh, yeah, some guys, it's interesting. Some some athletes kind of thrive 
on that. They need yeah. that kick in the butt. But you I'm like a guy that like shoots the same way you used to be. Like it's like people are a lot more sensitive and like raising your voice to the crew. Let's go. Like there's a fine line between passion mm. and going too far. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like like I have a deep voice, and it's like, hey man, you gotta like easy. I'm like. You're, you're trying to motivate somebody or like somebody misses focus. They're like, okay, all right, you miss focus. Enough. But if, when somebody misses focus four times, you're like, come on, man, let's go. And you're like, I mean, at a certain point, when you can't be getting the result, it's like, hey, you try and run around and the guy misses his block three times. Well, you either replace the guy. At a certain point, you got to be like, all right, get me somebody else. Yeah. Because when you can't start running your offense, I think sports are a big analogy to it, you know, and you got to like, look, the culture's changed. You know, you can't say the same thing or be the same way that you did. My high school football coach would grab me by the mask and blah, blah, blah. Like, fuck that. You can't do that anymore. That'll get a coach fired now. Damn right. But there is a version of that, though, for the modern person, right? Like, I told we are all picturing the face mask grab. I was going to ask this question like, what is an appropriate face mask grab these days? You can't put touch people, you can't yell at them, you can't, you know, how do you physically reset somebody? You know, you can't, you can't can't physically, you can't physically do it. What's the modern way of doing it, though? Like, how do you, you know, take that 25 year old kid that needs something? You mean an actor or a, yeah, well, a, yeah, and, or anybody on the crew? Anybody? You just have to do it slowly and calmly. Put on this uh, helmet. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you privately, quietly. You just can't put anybody at risk. Yeah, and you can't put the crew at risk to say, "Oh, I feel unsafe because the director's being an animal." Right. And you can't do it. You can't do it. One person's come on, let's fucking go. You can't do that. You really got to like, you know, behavior that would have been accepted is not accepted anymore. That's the bottom line. I remember I I was a few years ago, I was telling in a pre-production meeting, the art department, we were shooting in an alley in New Rochelle, New York. Now, it was obvious that they were going to go in and make the alley safe. But I said, I said, I really want the alley to feel really dirty and dingy, right? Meaning in your set dressing, the way the alley looked and the way I wanted it to appear on camera were one and the same. In no way was it like, yeah, yeah, keep the broken glass there and let the actor sit in that. But even the implication that I said, oh, I want it to be dirty and shitty looking was misconstrued as that I did not, that I wanted to put the crew's safety at risk. And it was just a verbal like, hey, you know what? You should be careful about, I was like, Really? You're going to read into that? I was like, but you know what? That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And it was clear. They said, look, we know, you know, so sometimes I like to write things. It's better to write things down and say, did everybody read that and understand it? Because then there's not any, there's no tonal difference, Mm -hmm. right? When I say I'm going for the authenticity, you know, it's like telling a stunt guy, the stunt guy's going to be safe. This is the protocol, you know? but everybody knows the effect you want. So an actor knows. So it's really, I think, just the environment. Everybody wants to feel safe to do their best work, you know? So you have to just be cognizant of that and um, very aware of that. It is the world. And, uh, you know, as easy it is to do a direct line thing by grabbing someone's face mask, that's no longer the world. At least not if you want to keep working. You know, it's just not the thing. I'll be honest with you. It wasn't cool for my coach to do that 35 years ago. Yeah, it's got, okay? that was, yeah. She did not have to grab my face mask to get my attention. So I've never, I've never been into that or like that was him. It wasn't cool when Woody Hayes did it to Charlie Bauman. It's never, you know, like, like there's a line, you know, you know, and when people cross it, it's clear. So that was a line with Woody Hayes. How long ago was that thing? He got shit canned. So it's never that physical assault is never acceptable. Is there any room for uh, in your in your casting process that actor can be if if you trust them? Can you trust them that they will be the whole idea of being? And I go, you know, I I keep going back to sports analogies, but it's just in my brain, and I appreciate that about 
your background, but is like being coachable. I think, I think one of the things that made me, you know, pretty much realize to a high level, my athletic potential, because I made it to the NFL is I was coachable. I was good. It was, it was a strength in me where I, I saw guys of about equal talent sometimes that just, just they, they weren't, they weren't very good about working t- together and they weren't, uh, they just sort of, it was a blind spot for them. And I think it's one thing that, that, that helped me. Is it, is that, is that a reasonable um, way to view uh, working with an actor, particularly probably for a long period of time, whether it's a leading role or something like a series regular? Series regular, day player, it's all, like, I, I've cast people and I've never even seen them act before. You know what I mean? Like, once you have that trust, once you feel like, like Sophie Turner from, was in Game of Thrones. I'd never seen Game of Thrones. We did a half hour Skype call and her love of the material and my understanding of the material and sharing that. Like, we're looking at each other like, I got it. I knew she was a good actress. I didn't have yeah. to, like, see her act, the passion by which she connected to the material, her emotional intelligence. Great. She's an artist. I know that, like, you know, it's like, and sometimes artists run out of gas or on the shoot day 21 out of 40 she's like exhausted and you have to like keep her and the other actor going and they're like they're tired of walking like across the mountains when are we going to act i'm like this is acting (laughs) every step (laughs) you take every gesture and i would go tell him a story about jeff bridges who would be on like typing on a computer you got to make everything real man just because you're walking doesn't mean like you're not like Corey and sophie walking across the snow like talking about you know, like what you had for breakfast the other day, but like, I've got to believe that you're on the top of the mountain and you haven't been eaten in three days. Like if you don't show that physically, it's not believable for the audience. So I have to be the audience. I'm the first audience. I'm the first eye. So it's got to feel right when I see it. And so I look for people that are engaged, emotionally intelligent. And sometimes I've done commercials and it's a cattle call and I ask them about themselves. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about your father. I'll play a little game with them, a little acting game. Or here, try this or do it slower. Do it just to see how smart they are, how I want to get along with them. So sometimes it'll be like, great, here's 12 people in a music video. They're an ensemble. I like them. If somebody seems kind of like fear-filled and controlling or questioning, that's okay if I really like the specificity of their look but I'll know that like, great, I'll spend 15 minutes to get that shot and I might spend 45 minutes to get somebody else. Each thing is different. Dialogue, non-dialogue, uh, you know, like Hitchcock says, like a visual prop. Like each, each performer, each, each, per- each, each flesh inhabitant is different and serves a different purpose in different platforms and genres. And I just look for people like, hmm, they feel right and have something going on that excites me to work with them. Mark, Mark delivers, you know, I love your answers. They're <laughs> so thoughtful. I appreciate that. Like That's you awesome. could come in, like some actors are not good readers, right? You could come in. Now, if I, Ted Levine, famously Robert De Niro, uh, Michael Rooker, some guys are like, they'll come in and they'll read the script. We've seen what they do. And sometimes somebody comes in and be like, like, I could see you and be like, God, I want you to play this guy. Here, just read something. Like, great. I just want you to slow down your speech pattern. You can add a little Southern to it. Great. I want you to go work on that. And it's like an instrument. Like, I want you to play a certain instrument in the thing. Right? Other people can go do anything. Other people are fresh and raw. And you're like, I like that they're untrained. I like they don't know what they're doing. Good. Don't fix it. Let them be afraid on camera. Oh my God, they're terrified. They're nervous. Great. Let them work through it. Because once that's why I like to shoot a lot of takes and not cut. So they stop thinking of the process. Cut, hair, baby. No. Keep going. So they're just like, they're forgetting that there's a camera there. And they're just now behaving. They're just sort of like behaving. And being and they're not sure and they're like i'm not really sure what i'm doing i'm like perfect perfect that's good 
I'm going to, my takeaway from, from that and God, if you're talking about finishing on a high note is yeah. behaving. So you didn't say that you never once mentioned the word acting. You said behaving. Love it. Some people I've seen the greatest actors go through a scene, like the emotional tear jerker and you yell cut and they're like, is there any sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, right. I mean, incredibly technical, think, oh, right? Other ones are really into it. Yeah. And I remember doing an episode of Cold Case one time, and in Cold Case, it was like all this great reliving this trauma. And this woman had gone through this four page scene and like getting her belaying bare her whole trauma and shame. And the final take was like, and cut, check the gate. 30 seconds later, it was good. The house lights come on, right? The lights of the stage, come on, people are leaving. Like, and like, like, oh, we're going to Joe's for a drink, blah, blah, blah. And the poor woman is sitting here like this, like, and I went over to her and like, like, you realize the dream factory, like, you're just, you're making it up. But she, as an actor, was still in that space. She had gone someplace really deep. She was not just going to, she was not going to turn it off and say, where's the ham sandwiches, right? Wow. She no. needed to, like, Okay, let me walk you to your trailer. How you doing? She laid it all in the field, right? She laid it all out there. But it was on. It was it was embedded in at that time film, and that was her job. So everybody's got their job to do. God bless her. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah to be that good at any one thing, you know, to really leave and, it out there like that. That's great. To will great. the willing willingness to expose herself. Yeah. And, Wow. But <laughs> some people, some actors can do it and can just go there and just, they have the craft, they have like, and it doesn't mean it's not unemotional, but they don't have to, they're not like all met. They don't have to like, just call me by the character's name. Like each one is different. Yeah. So once you know, you know, once you know how to drive the car, right? Yeah. And again, well, I listen. And then get awesome. a good and get a good editor. Yeah, get it. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like Benicio when you say it's all about the editing. He says that all the time to me. It's yeah. I'm sure I'm sure he's done great. You can see some dog shit movies and be like, the actors didn't think that they were in this bad of a movie. They didn't know that boy, the camera's in the wrong place, or boy, the editing is going to be lousy, or the score is going to be mediocre, or the look is going to be kind of shitty. You see them giving it their all, but like, maybe it was, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure he can share stories about that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, Mark has a heart out, and I want to respect that. And Mark, listen, it's always great. I, I can't wait to do another one. And really, that was awesome. Just the inside stuff is just so good, man. I really appreciate you. Inside baseball. Anytime, guys. I love <laughs> Thanks, Mark. That's right, awesome. See you guys. Yeah. Have a great day.